Welcome. The theme for this yin yoga practice will be the winter solstice and also reflecting on the phrase known as letting go, often heard in during a group yoga practice. What does that actually mean? We'll do a little bit of breath work and a quick warm up, and then the postures in the in sequence will be both sides of butterfly pose, both sides of dragon pose both sides of a reclined spinal twist and then finally wide knee child's pose which i like to call baby frog so useful props might be a couple of yoga blocks if you have them looks can do too a soft bolster, yoga bolster that you can make substitutes with pillows blankets and couch cushions and any other soft padding that you would like to have maybe a spare blanket or two. So gather up your props and maybe spend some time to decide what the phrase letting go means to you in these waning days before, before the start of the new year. The practice starts in a seated position, something that feels well-rooted, stable, secure, safe, with a little bit of space around you. You can take a moment to notice your breath, notice the conditions of your practice area, the sounds, the temperature, the smells, the... and then you can dive back into your body, notice the little the little sensations inside of your body, maybe the contact points that you're that, that the lower part of your body makes with whatever it's sitting on here. We'll start with a bit of breath work. So I call this breathing a modified form of box breath. So it's big, big inhales, big exhales with a little bit of pause in between them. So after, after you've kind of gotten comfortable with noticing your breath, we'll start the first cycle. So you exhale. And then when you inhale, you'll inhale slowly for a slow count of four. So a so four second inhale, I, I kind of count with thousands when I inhale. So begin the inhale and inhale for a count of one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand is at the end of your inhale and then pause for a second. So one, one thousand second pause and then exhale for the same four seconds. So Exhaling one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, and then pause there at the end of the exhale for one second, one one thousand. So that's one cycle. We'll begin again. So another cycle is inhale one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand. Pause in your breath for a second, one one thousand, and then exhale. Four one thousand, three one thousand, two one thousand, one one thousand, and then pause for a breath here. So you can continue this. I'll continue this without cueing for two more cycles. You can continue this on your own, or you can come back to your normal natural breath if this is getting too uncomfortable. So two more cycles here. And then at some point, just come back to whatever your breath is doing. That is your normal and natural breath. Just notice that here. And we'll take some time continuing with this soft breathing to just notice and, and remind ourselves again of this idea of what's your idea of letting go. So often when it's proposed in a yoga practice, the idea is to Try to determine, sense, and pay attention to something in one's existence that is no longer useful, is no, is no longer serving you. 
And then do you need to hold on to that? If you don't, then the idea is to, that's where the idea of letting it go has come from. However, it's a very difficult idea. So just maybe notice, maybe notice some things here. Or maybe you're clinging to, and yet they don't have any obvious purpose. Um, it's obvious is maybe not a word to use because maybe maybe we have to think about it for a while to understand that yeah it's not terribly useful here and that's that's the advanced practice that's the advanced yoga here so maybe a couple more breaths here and then a, a few quick warm-up exercises before we get into the yin the yin posture is proper so we'll try we'll try half circle pose here so come to your hands and knees, nice stable table pose on all fours here. And then extend your right leg out to the side. Right foot is well planted into the ground. Right leg is extended, left knee, left shin, top of the left foot is grounding. And then come up to kind of, kind of just kneeling here with the right leg extended. And then extend your arms out to either side, slowly begin to bend laterally bend over to the left side so you have the left hand on the ground and then raise the right arm up towards the ceiling and then push through the left arm and lengthen through through the right arm here maybe for another breath here and then slowly slowly engage your abdomen just to create some core strength as you bring yourself up and then come back to to kneeling or all the way to hands and knees and then do the other side. So extend the left leg up. Left foot is rooted and feels rooted and grounding here. And then bring yourself up to a kneeling position. Same procedure here. Arms come out wide and then laterally bend. Put the right arm down. Extend the left arm up. There's a little bit of toning always going on through your core here just to create a sense of stability here. And then inhale, bring yourself all the way up. Arms come down. And then from here, make your way onto your belly. Legs comfortably extended out behind you. We'll do some active back bends here before we get into, get into butterfly here. So I call these wide-armed cobra poses here. So legs are extended. They can be a comfortable distance apart. So maybe hip width apart. And then take your bend your elbows, take your hands, shoulder height, and then move them out away from the shoulders. Maybe in maybe a foot and a half or so. This is this is the wide wide arm version here. And then inhale and begin to lift your heart, lift your head, lift your sternum off the ground, just using the muscles in the back of your torso. When when that stops. Then you can push through your hands and lift up a little bit more in a little bit higher cobra pose and then very slowly lower yourself down. We'll do that three more times. So we can maybe match this with our breath. So on a nice big inhale, press and lift yourself up. However height is, seems appropriate for you. And then exhale, lower yourself back down. There's a couple more cycles here. So inhale and lift up high here. And then exhale and slowly lower yourself back down. And you can bring your hands in a little bit closer when you're ready. Push yourself up and out of that pose. And then we'll get into the yin sequence. So the first yin posture is half butterfly. Come to seated. If you have a lot of tightness in your legs and your low back, you can sit up on a little bit of height like I'm doing. Even if you don't have a lot of tightness in your legs or your low back, you can still sit up on a little bit of height, like a folded blanket or a cushion here. Legs start out extended in front of you. And then bend the right knee. Lower the right knee out to the right. And then start to slowly bring the right heel in towards the hip. You're doing this slowly so that you stop when when you feel the stopping point here. Heel might, might, might make it to the hip, maybe it doesn't here. You're, all no, you're also noticing what this knee feels like here. And if you need padding to stabilize this knee, you can always put some extra padding 
underneath this knee. By the way, this knee can be bent too in the extended leg here. Since this is yin, you can relax the muscles in the extended leg and if it tends to roll in because you're exter internally rotated, that's fine. If it rolls out because you're externally rotated in this leg, that's fine too here. This is the beginning of half butterfly. So you can stay here. If you're feeling a lot of juiciness, sensations in the legs and the hips, and this is enough for you for now, invite yourself to stay here. The next step is to kind of face the extended leg, maybe for a moment with a nice long neutral spine. Hinge forward and then release and relax your torso. Let it round over that extended leg. Release the muscles in your torso to where you stop. Now, if you feel you need some support for your head, your neck, or your torso, start grabbing props and build a support system here. Otherwise, you can just stay here. And we'll, we'll stay here in these postures three, three and a half minutes or so per side. So I will remind you the principles of a yin practice. So the foundation of a yin practice is we're actually trying to relax the muscle fiber so that the traction goes into the connective tissue and then we want to stay for a certain period of time so that traction kind of soaks into the connective tissue. We do that with the, these three principles. The first principle is finding your edge and that means moving your body into your shape of a particular posture. The edge is not painful, it's not, it's not a place of trauma or injury. Um, it can be a place where sensations are fairly unfamiliar and therefore uncomfortable, but it's not a place where that's creating des des desperation here. So, but if, you, but if you are trying to affect the tissues, then maybe you want to feel something. So your edge is that, that in between, that, that balance here. Second principle is called stillness. Once you've found your appropriate edge, and for each of us, our shape and our depth is different, then you decide to create and cultivate the patience and the fortitude to stay for a while. That's the stillness part. The stillness doesn't mean rigidity or frozenness. You're not freezing yourself into the posture. You're just, you're just residing, quietly residing in the posture. And then the third, the third principle is time. So you may, you decide to just stay here for quite a bit longer than we normally stay in posture, say in a much faster moving uh, yoga flow. Here. So we're, we're trying to stay for several minutes, but again, that's part of our edge. And for some of us, one minute is long enough. For some of us, maybe we want to linger for five or even 10 minutes in a posture. We've been here for a little over two. So we'll go for another minute here, if that's okay. If you're deciding that you, you've had enough of this posture, then please invite yourself out to do some other kind of motion or some rest here. Otherwise, if you're staying here and if you've, if you've kind of lost your sense of where your stopping point is and the sensations, allow yourself to relax some more and move more deeply onto this side. So this is, this is the basis for practice. And again, some shapes will feel reasonable and some shapes won't. I don't know which ones they are because they're different for each person here. So a couple more breaths on this side here. And if you fold it forward and you're ready to come out, plant your hands on the ground, use the muscles in your arms to slowly do the work of pressing your torso back up. When it gets back up, tone through your torso, straighten your spine back to neutral. Do little movements if you need to, to work out the reverberation and the stagnation of that posture here. And then then slowly at some point, bring that right knee up, extend the right leg forward, point and flex the feet a few times and bob the knees up and down just to work out the kinks in the legs. And then we'll set up for the other side of half butterfly. So again, legs start out extended. 
This time it's the other leg that bends. So bend the left knee, lower the left knee out to the side, and then draw the left heel in as far as it goes until you start feeling some sort of resistance or a stopping point in this part of the leg in the hip here. Right leg is straight here, and you can just decide to stay just seated right here and enjoy and enjoy the this shape or if you want to you can fold forward again this is a forward fold where we're rounding and relaxing the spine so that we can get some lengthening on the back side of the torso some like compression on the front side of the torso we'll stay here for another three minutes and once you've settled, once you've rediscovered your breath, maybe notice your thoughts, notice the physical sensations, we can get back to this, this idea of this, this phrase that we often hear kind of thrown out randomly in yoga classes called letting go. And this, this practice, I'm, I'm recording this video a few days before the winter solstice. So the winter solstice is symbolically represents the beginning. It's the end, but also the beginning of a new year cycle, a new, new season of cycle. This was, this is, this is universal among, among human cultures as, as marking the winter solstice as the end, but also the beginning of the new year. By the way, um, in the southern hemisphere, the winter solstice is is six months from the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, and the native cultures down there celebrated it celebrated it as the beginning of the year down there, which would have been in June rather than in December. But we want to reflect. I want to reflect on the end of the year. So this is actually not the winter solstice. That I'm recording this video on this is this is a few days before and prior to the winter solstice it's the waning season of the year just like the moon has has cycles and it has a waning period of time where it gets kind of smaller and smaller and finally the phases just disappear when it goes back into the new moon the waning days before the winter solstice or the the ending days and Again, symbolically, metaphorically, allegorically, us humans see that as a time to take stock and to reflect on the intentions we set during the year, the manifestations of whatever happened during the year, and then finally the integration and the releasing, the letting go of whatever happened that that is no longer consequential to us. We have about five or six more breaths to go on this side, if that's okay. Maybe reconnect with your edge, adjust your posture if you need to, or come out and rest. The idea here is to take that idea and think about our own lives, our own being, our own internal landscape, and to maybe do the hard work, the searching, the journey to find those deep aspects about ourselves that we hold about ourselves that are no longer useful. In other words, they're just, they're not true. Anything that's not truthful tends to not be very useful. And this is, this is, this is the hard work of letting go is to just first identify these things these things in ourselves, it's like, is this really true about me? And sometimes the answer is, is this, this idea that I have about myself is actually not really true, even though I, I, I came to want it to be true and I hold it over myself all the time. It's like, this is you, and the answer is no, it's not really you, right? Or this is me, no, it's not really me. It's, it's, can be, it can be a hard journey, it's a difficult, difficult journey. Um, it's a difficult idea. So we're slowly coming out of this posture and you're ready. Bring yourself back up. Lengthen out through your spine. 
maybe a little bit of integration or counter poses for the torso. Those are pretty powerful forward folds to do here. You can bring that leg up and extend it out. And again, you can point and flex the feet a few times. So a counter, nice counter pose might be just some gentle cat and cow. Since these were forward bends, maybe start out with cow pose. So gently make your way onto hands and knees, come to table, and then sink your belly into a back bend. So sternum moves forward and up, tailbone tilts up into a nice cow stretch here. And this might feel kind of, kind of intense because of all the forward folding. And then you can slowly move yourself into a nice cat forward fold stretch and then back into cow and then however many cycles and however fast you would like to do this for the next couple of breaths. We'll move into the next posture. Now the going, now the going gets tough here. And again, we're, we're contemplating these, these things that are stuck in our brains that may or may not serve us anymore, even though they're well ingrained here. So the next yin posture will be dragon pose. So from hands and knees, bring that right foot up in between your hands, into the left knee back this low lunge here. So hands are, are rooted on something. So if your hands don't reach the floor, then get some blocks to place underneath your hands. Remember the blocks have different height settings, so you can adjust them here. So find, find that maybe, maybe the back knee or the back ankle is, is in desperation. So put, soft padding under that back shin here. If dragon doesn't fit you, you can always do what I call inverted dragon, which is half happy baby pose. So you come onto your back, you can extend the left leg, um, bend the right knee, bring the right knee in and see if you can clasp the right foot with your hands and then allow that right knee to just drift towards the ground. By the way, if you can't reach the foot, you can just grab your shin or your ankle here. And this is, this will get deep into the hip and you'll get a kind of a nice lengthening in the psoas and the left side too. So that's a good option. Otherwise we'll stay here in dragon for a few more minutes here. And we're going to tell a story about just how hard, just how hard it is for everyone to sometimes let go of something that's not quite true. So many decades ago, a science education group did a study. They, they were doing a study to try to understand science misconceptions and scientific illiteracy in the United States. So what they did is they actually came up to recent college graduates that graduated from Harvard University. So recent Harvard graduates here. So Harvard University is one of the most prestigious and well famous private universities in the United States. So the presumption is, is that the people that graduate from there very, very entitled and, and highly educated people. Kind of, kind of sometimes called the cream of the crop, if you will. Very, very, hopefully very successful people. And so these people were interviewed and after they graduated from Harvard, they asked, they asked, they were asked one question. What causes the seasons on earth? That was the question. 80%, 80% of the respondents replied, these Harvard graduates, 80% of them replied, the seasons are caused by the earth being closer to the sun in the summer and farther away from the sun in the winter. 80% of them replied this way. Harvard graduates, mind you. 
it was a bit of a shocking revelation that the percentage was so high. We have about another minute on this side of dragon. Come out if you need to. Because we're all taught the correct answer in school several times, starting in early grade school. We get taught the correct reason for the seasons, which is the tilt of the Earth's axis. So the Earth rotates one time every day. That axis of rotation is tilted to the axis of rotation of Earth's orbit around the sun. That difference, that difference in, in, that in degrees in axis is about 23.5 degrees. And it's that, that orientation, that tilt of the Earth that stays constant. And, it, and depending on which pole of that axis you're referring to, if the pole of the axis is pointing away from the sun, then that hemisphere experiences winter pole is tilted towards the sun during another part of the year, that part of the season experiences summer. This is, explains why the different northern and southern hemispheres experiences seasons in reverse, because their poles are pointed in opposite directions. So just one more breath here, I'm coming out of dragon pose here. You can come out slowly however you would like to. I'm going to recommend downward facing dog, but since that's not everybody's favorite pose, you can do something else. But the nice thing about downward facing dog and this young arm balance, you can extend your legs and take them for a walk and work out the work out a lot of the the stagnation that build up the the stiffness. And then when you're ready, do the other side of dragon then. Come back to hands and knees, and now bring that left foot up into the right leg back here. And you can do inverted dragon on this side, if you will. Set yourself up with padding and props, and then get started here. But of course, the real, real question, the real mystery about all of this business is, 80% of these Harvard graduates believe in something that's not true. Even though they have been taught the correct scientific explanation for the season. So the question is why? Why are they hanging on to this idea here? And it's, it's interesting. It's like, I don't know, where, where, did, where did they get this idea? By the way, it's like just to just to explain why the seasons aren't really caused by the distance from the Earth to the Sun is so the Earth's orbit around the Sun is almost perfectly um, circular. It's it's not perfectly circular. It is elliptical, and by elliptical, what the implication of it being slightly elliptical means it does approach the Sun a little bit closer some parts of the year and is a little bit farther away in other parts of the, the year, but not by much. And because of that, the total variation of that effect of the Earth being a little bit farther away and a little bit closer, closer the maximum variation of average surface temperatures of the Earth is one degree, one degree per over a year which is something that most of us wouldn't even notice, certainly not the dramatic effect of the real seasons if you live in northern north hemisphere or the southern southern, southern hemisphere. In fact, for those of us who live in the northern hemisphere, the Earth reaches its closest point to the sun in early January. So if it really was the distance to the sun, we should all be experiencing high summer in January. And again, if you live in northern North Hemisphere, that obviously probably not happening here. So, so the distance to the sun is 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 insignificant to compare to something else going on here. So why? So why do we think it is the distance? Maybe. 
maybe we can put forth this this anecdote of something that we maybe taught ourselves when we were very very small when we were trying to learn about how the physical world around us worked here so we have about have about three more breaths here on this side of the dragon maybe check in check in with your breath is there anything is there anything that's you're holding on to that doesn't need to be a part of the posture here. One more breath. And then slowly bring yourself out. Again, any kind of movements that you would like to do to work out the kinks, maybe it's downward facing dog, you can. I'm going to suggest for a counter exercise some, some more a supported back bend cycle in here. So a series of bridge poses here. So slowly make your way onto your back. Bend your knees, put your feet on the ground here. Feet fairly close into your hips here. Arms extended along your torso, palms face down to root your hands, your arms, your shoulders into the ground here. Feet are rooted here. Head and neck are neutral and comfortable here. And then on your next inhale, inhale and press your hips up towards the ceiling. Press through your feet, your shoulders, engage the muscles in your legs to lift your hips up just as high as they go. And then with just as much slow controlled effort, slowly lower them back to the ground. And we'll do this three more times. So when you're on your next inhale, inhale and lift your hips up towards the ceiling again, maybe see if you can go a little bit higher this time and then exhale. And we lower everything back down. Two more cycles here. So inhale. Then exhale. Final one here. Inhale. And then exhale. And then the next, the next in posture is a, is a reclined spinal twist here. So keep the right knee bent and extend the left leg long here, and then draw the right knee in slightly towards your torso. Maybe shift your hips over to the right a little bit, just for some people to make it easier to twist. And then take your left arm and place it on the right knee and help guide and draw that right knee over to the left side. Right shoulder and upper body is trying to stay close to the floor here. So we're making, we're, we're, we're making a twist in our torso, a spinal twist here. So the knee goes over as far as it goes. The shoulder tries to stay as close to the ground as far as it goes. Both of them might be floating and that's okay. You might want, you might want something to stabilize that knee if it doesn't make it to the floor. Some people, the knee will make it to the floor. You can just comfortably rest on the floor. Some of us, like me, my knee floats, but my knee is fine floating, so I let it float. You can extend the right arm up to the right to help encourage the right shoulder. You can even kind of let that right arm ooze up above your head here. I get a wonderful additional stretch in my shoulder when I do that. If that's too much, then keep the arm down here. You can experiment here and just figure out what a good arm position is. Head can stay neutral here in this pose. Or if it's okay with your head and your neck, it can turn and look away from the knees and you get an additional stretch up through the cervical spine, through the neck region here. And this is the next pose. By the way, if the extended leg is creating problems for you, you can always bend both the knees. Otherwise, you can keep that extended leg straight here. And then we'll stay here for a few minutes. There's something to think about is I believe that when we were all small children, we probably, we were learning with our senses about the world and, and we, we made a lot of logical discoveries 
of how, of how things actually worked, at least on our immediate scale. I think about this a lot, and it's probably where we come up with our deep misconceptions of, of the sun and how seasons are caused. Because when we were little kids, we had that, we had that moment when we were experimenting with some sort of bright heat source, something that glowed brightly and it was also hot. And we realized, let's take, let's take a, a fire in a fireplace, a wood fire around a campfire or in a fireplace. And it's fairly chilly out. And so if you're not near the fire, it, you feel fairly cold. So you tend to move towards the fire. So as small children, we, we move towards that bright flame. And as we got closer to it, physically closer to it, at some point we started to feel, feel that warmth, that warmth from that wood fire. And then, we did the experiment of slowly moving away, farther away from the light, from the fire. And sure enough, there was less warmth, there was less heat, we got colder. So we moved back and, and we, we, we slowly taught ourselves empirically, right? No one had to teach us this. We taught ourselves this as small children that, ah, when I get close, to something that's very bright and very hot. I can feel the warmth. And when I get farther away, it's less warm. And the amazing thing about that is that's some kind of general logic that we can, can maybe apply to other things. So we apply it to any kind of bright, warm object in our vicinity. And ultimately, we apply it to the ultimate bright, warm thing that we notice every day, which is the sun. It's like, well, here is a bright object that I can obviously feel the warmth of. And so maybe that has something to do to, as to why it's always hot outside and why it's always cold outside. So there we ultimately apply apply this logic that actually doesn't work. It's not the reason that it's colder in the winter. It's the, it's actually the, the slanted rays of the sunshine lower in the sky because, because of the tilt, because of the indirect slanting of, of the rays impinging on the ground and not effectively warming the ground in the wintertime as more effectively it does in the summertime. So one more breath here um, and then slowly begin to unfold. And then a little bit of counter pose time. You can draw both knees into your chest. A little, this is a light forward bend. You can, you can kind of let them extend up towards the ceiling. Now, or we can set up for the other side of this twist. So now the other leg is extended, right leg extends. Bring the left knee in, inch your hips over if you need to, and then take your right hand to guide the left knee over to the left. Left arm extends up to the left. To help encourage the shoulder. By the way, you can put padding under the shoulder if it's floating. Or you can just allow that shoulder to, to root onto the ground and don't worry about the knee. But maybe the knee needs some padding too. And then you can experiment with moving this left arm up and down here. And then we'll stay here. Decide where your neck has to be. Maybe your head needs to just stay neutral, or maybe you can turn your head away from the knee here and then just settle in. Maybe check in with your breath. Maybe, maybe again, notice if there's anything in this pose that you can let go of. If there's too much pain somewhere, maybe let go of the idea that you have to stay in that pain. Maybe change. The pain is not useful here. So we learn, we learn this, this, this amazing bit of logic that bright things like a fire emit more heat. We feel the more heat when we're closer, less heat when we're farther away. And we, 
we tuck that little bit of information deep down into our subconscious. It's like, this is, this is what we learned. And, and then we go to school and in the school, they, they teach us the real scientific reason why the, why the seasons are. They teach us about the orbit of the earth and the, the axis of rotation of the earth. And because that axis is tilted, the, the rays of the light are more direct. We, we learn this early on in school and probably early grade school. We learn it several times throughout our school career. And we probably learn it well enough to, to replicate it on some sort of quiz or exam. And then we probably forget about it and go back to this deep seated idea of things are warmer when you're closer to them and things are hotter when you're farther away from them. To the point that when you finally graduate from college and some kind of education survey person walks up to you and you, they ask you what are the reasons for the seasons and you reply not what you learned in school but that that very fundamental experiment that you did when you were very small this this idea of feeling the warmth of something bright when you were close so and yet it's still there it still exists in our unconscious and when we think about it more we realize well okay that's can't be true because the earth is not really that much closer to the sun. And if it was also true, the entire earth would experience the same seasons instead of the opposite seasons. We, we don't go that deep. We, we dig up something that's, that's still there, but not useful. We haven't, we haven't let it go yet. And it's hard to do something deeply ingrained into the way we think. Just a couple more breaths here on this side of the spinal twist. Slowly bring yourself out of the twist. You can extend your legs, you can wobble around a bit. You can maybe just sit here in stillness with a nice neutral spine. And then when you do feel ready, Bend both of your knees, roll over to one side, bring yourself up. Our last long-held yin pose is wide knee to child's pose or baby frog pose. So you'll come to hands and knees, bring your knees wide. So maybe mat width, maybe even wider than mat width. And then slowly lower your torso forward. Maybe extend your arms forward. Now maybe this, this is a little bit desperate maybe you need a little bit of padding so bring kind of put all the padding you need under knees and shins and ankles or underneath your hips or your torso make this make this something that that's a little bit more restorative in nature so maybe none of us are not all of us are built to be in this posture comfortably so this is that's where you use props and then set yourself up to spend a few minutes here. And this is, this is maybe in this pose, this is where, where we think a little bit. So if it's so difficult to, to understand that a concept as fundamental as the seasons of the year, if it's so difficult to understand the correct reason and to to kind of let go of this this deep unconscious reason that we've held on to since we were tiny children don't feel so bad when you come across something that you've some misconception about yourself that you've been holding on to your whole life that when you weigh the evidence, it's not really true. It never was true. And maybe hold that for a while. 
hold it before letting it go. Just examine it and, and contemplate it for a while. And then maybe in time it will become easier. It will become easier to let go. So maybe during this, this, this final pose in, in Shavasana, the idea is to just discover beliefs and ideas and thoughts that you have about your own being. That if you think about it long enough, you realize it was never true about you. And specifically, I'm talking about a lot of the critical judgments that we make about ourselves. Are those all really true? How long have we spent our whole lives hanging those ideas over our heads and criticized ourselves for those? Some of those we're going to find upon examination are just simply not true. And if they're not true, they're not useful. If they're not useful, they're not serving us. Those are the very things that we're trying to find and let go. And a great time, a great symbolic time to do that sort of work is is in the waning days before the beginning of the new year, before, before the winter solstice, whether it be in December, if you're in the northern hemisphere, or in June, if you're in the southern hemisphere. So five more breaths here. And when you feel ready, slowly bring yourself up. Make your way slowly back onto your back. One little integration exercise before the final resting posture. Bend your knees. And then place your feet on the floor. Wrap your right thigh around your left thigh. So we're kind of making eagle legs or shoelace legs here. And then bring your knees in towards your torso. Maybe take your hands, grab your knees and pull your knees in with your hands here. Maybe you can stay here and just kind of breathe here. If you can reach, take your left hand, find your right foot, right hand, find your left foot. And then use your hands and your arms to kind of gently pull on your legs here towards, kind of towards your armpits and towards the floor here until you're feeling a little bit of oomph in the outsides of the hips here. Maybe hold this for a breath or two. And then at some point release, unwind the legs, wind them in the other direction. So the left thigh over the right thigh. Same procedure. You can bring the knees in and just hold the knees with the legs. Maybe this is, this is good enough for you. Or if you can reach the feet, find, find the feet with the hands and then gently pull on the feet to kind of pull the legs, the shins down towards the floor until you can start feeling it in your hips and your outer thighs here. Just one more breath here. And then go ahead and release. And then any kind of little movements or free form yoga that you need to work out the imbalances and the kinks of the practice. And then when you're ready, slowly move yourself into your final resting pose, which could be your favorite restorative posture. It could be sitting quietly in a meditative seat. Or it can be kind of this traditional shavasana form here. We're just lying on the, on the floor. Arms and legs extended. Maybe legs, feet far enough away so that the legs can gently roll either in or out. Same with the arms. Arms are extended far enough from the waist so the palms can roll up and face the ceiling. Head and neck are neutral. Shoulders are comfortable. You can add pillows and blankets. And then this is just where you soften. Soften and release. Release 
and let go of the physical tension in your face, your jaw, your, your tongue, the inside of your mouth. Let go of the tension in your eye sockets. Let go of the tension in your forehead and your temples. Let go of all of the tension in the skin of your face and around your ears, even the crown of your head. Let go of clinging to your thoughts so the thoughts will still be there. See if you can let them drift for a moment. Continue to soften here. Soften your upper body, your, your shoulders and your collarbones. Soften your arms, your hands, your palms, your, your right palm, your right fingers, your left palm, left fingers. Soften. Sense, notice the tips of your fingers. See if you can notice your own energy there. Relax and release through your torso. Soften your rib cage. Release your abdomen. Soften and release down through your hips, your thighs and knees, your shins and calves, the heels and ankles of your feet tops of your feet, bottoms of your feet, your toes on each foot, toes on your left foot, soften, toes on your right foot, soften. Release, relax, surrender your body-mind 100%. Feel yourself both melting into the floor and sublimating into the air of the room and a spontaneous type of surrendering and letting go, particularly any of those aspects that were never really you in the first place. Begin to bring yourself back and slowly deepen your breath. Maybe make little movements with some fingers, little movements with your toes, and you can gently begin to move your arm, your hands, your arms, your feet, your legs, and and maybe even gently roll your head from side to side. When you're feeling ready. Slowly begin to bend your knees and then roll yourself gently over onto one side. When you get there, stay there for a moment. Cultivate a deep sense of gratitude for your efforts and your practice. But as always, 
please cultivate a deep sense of gratitude for you, your unique manifestation in this universe. Because the universe is ecstatically grateful that you are here. And then when you're feeling ready, you have to bring yourself up. Find a comfortable and stable seat. When you get there, bring your hands together in front of heart center. I'll end this practice with an OM. sunlight in me honors the inner sunlight in you. Namaste.